Hello, thank you for joining me today as I discuss secure and resilient SCADA architectures built on top of AWS. My name is Sean Murray and I'm a Senior Partner Solutions Architect. And today I wanna to walk you through several architectures as we look at the journey of migrating SCADA to AWS and how leveraging AWS's security first approach and security services, along with our global and geographically redundant uh, infrastructure can allow you to build these secure and resilient systems. So you may be asking yourself, why would I want to migrate my SCADA server and SCADA system to the cloud to run on AWS? I understand that there are some concerns and risks and challenges that need to be addressed every time you modify, migrate, or think about making changes to your SCADA system. When it comes to migrating your SCADA servers to the cloud, I'm going to talk to you today about how you can gain better visibility and, obs and observability of your assets, how by leveraging the elasticity and size of AWS's cloud, you can really gain scalability by looking at how AWS's security services and our security first approach will really help you build that secure and resilient solution that covers all of your assets. And then finally, being able to integrate with all of the other AWS cloud services available to you, how you can quickly modernize and migrate to better make better use of the data that you have available to you or as you look to ingest additional data, how you can leverage those cloud services. Through this next section, I'm gonna be walking through several AWS architectures on how you could run your SCADA system in various configurations where the control can be closer to your, your edge devices or all the way in the AWS cloud. In this first architecture, I'm really going to be highlighting how you can run your local SCADA system on top of AWS Outpost Rack, which is a physical implementation of AWS's cloud computing inside your existing control room data center, and how you can still then leverage the AWS control plane and some of the other AWS services to benefit from the cloud. So if we start on the left and work our way to the right, You'll notice that this is your traditional configuration where you have your remote devices or substations uh, or any remote sites. They're connected back to your traditional primary control room, secondary control room, which could be your backup or your DR site, and even in some instances, perhaps a tertiary control room. Now, what, what we're highlighting here is the deployment of an AWS outpost rack inside that control room data center, having a WAN connection between two outposts. So you're building that resilient um, SCADA ser server solution between two sites, but they're physically located in your existing control rooms, but also having that outpost tied back through a service link to the AWS cloud for that control plane uh, communication, as well as the ability to replicate and move data from your AWS outpost into a private virtual private cloud or VPC running in an AWS region. And then you can have that in multiple availability zones for redundancy and resiliency. Moving on, one of the other architectures that you can also deploy is running a local SCADA system as you traditionally would today, but having your front end system running in AWS. So in this case, having your remote devices or substations using something such as AWS Global Accelerator, connecting into an AWS region or potentially multiple regions with multiple availability zones, again, to make sure that you're, you're building those highly resilient architectures. And in this case, being able to connect those remote devices to an AWS cloud, having your data centers with your control room SCADA servers running in your local uh, environments, also connecting to these front-end services, and then being able to pull all that communication back to your data center for SCADA. But now in this case, if you look to the right-hand side, being able to leverage a private endpoint so that you can move any of the data that you wanna take additional analysis on from your front-end servers into additional AWS servers um, such as Kinesis, Amazon S3, Amazon SQS, um, you're able to leverage AWS's private backbone through this endpoint and uh, take additional action on those uh, by leveraging those services. Now, again, one of the things I want to highlight in this infrastructure is the secure nature of leveraging VPN connections, virtual private gateways, to and private subnets. So again, we're building secure multi-layered architectures that is also highly resilient both from an availability zone, so having multiple availability zones, but also regional failures. So you have multiple regions with multiple availability zones in this architecture, while still keeping your SCADA systems local 
into your own data centers. Another ar approach in architecture that it's worth noting here is the idea of having a hybrid SCADA system. So in this case, looking at the left again, you have your traditional substation. Again, this could be substation or remote control site or a remote sensor or IoT sensor data. And what we're doing here is highlighting how through a direct connect, so not across the public internet, but through a direct connection um, using AWS Direct Connect into your AWS cloud, you could run your SCADA system in a region such as US East 1 within a private virtual private uh, cloud, so in a VPC. You could have all of that and then your SCADA servers running in multiple availability zones for that high availability in private subnets. Now in this case, some of the security features worth noting is again, that connection is not through the public internet. Now you could have at your substation side, the initiation of the connection to your AWS cloud, and then the communication back through that initiated connection. And from here, you could again, use those private endpoints to connect to additional AWS services, such as Kinesis, such as Amazon S3 or SQS. And then again, from there, being able to take additional action through your historians or your Durham solutions uh, on that data. But again, in this case, what we're highlighting is having a disaster recovery control room site, which could remain on premise and having a direct connection from that to your AWS cloud for replication of that SCADA uh, data. And again, in this instance, in the event that your AWS cloud is unavailable, you could fail over your control system back to your on-prem disaster recovery site, which is still connected to your substation or your remote site in the same manner that it is connected to today. And finally, the last architecture that I want to show uh, in this discussion is conceptually the idea of having a cloud SCADA system and leveraging regional failover. So very similar to the last uh, architecture that I highlighted where you had a cloud failing over to an on-prem. In this instance, the cloud failure uh, from one region is just to another re AWS region uh, within the AWS cloud. So you're still getting that geographic separation and you still have the high, high availability and redundancy and you get to leverage all of the AWS security services in both regions. So what you're seeing here again is that connection from a substation over in this architecture highlighting AWS um, global accelerator, but it could also be a direct connect or both into two different regions. So in this case, we're showing US East one in North Virginia, US East two in Ohio to private subnets where you have SCADA servers running and then having a database backend that's globally available and replicated across both of these regions and then also having both of these regions tied back to your control center and again that control center communication could be over a direct connect again so that you're not leveraging the private uh, public internet and that all the communications are kept private on the aws cloud's backbone and then in the event that you want to take some of that data and do additional analysis or leverage additional aws services making sure that you're using aws endpoints to connect to some of those other services over those public services over the AWS private backbone. Now, as I mentioned, as you're talking about building, as we talk about building all of these architectures and solutions, making sure that we're keeping security and governance, to, governance top of mind. Again, AWS takes security as our number one priority. And in the next section, I'm going to walk through some of the epics and services that we offer and provide to help you protect your solutions as you build on AWS and deploy on AWS. When it comes to AWS security, identity, and compliance, we have a lot of solutions in this space and we've divided them up here into different epics. So we're going to, I'm gonna talk a little bit about identity and access management and some of the services it provides, detection, infrastructure protection, data protection, and incident response. And then finally talk a little bit about compliance and how you can leverage as you build on AWS compliance of the cloud and all of the certifications that AWS has achieved and how those can be seen using services such as AWS Artifact. Now going back to identity and access management, as you build your solutions, making sure that you're authenticating and authorizing all the interactions, not only between services and servers, but also any of the human interactions with the environment. Leveraging something such as identity and access management, uh, AWS directory services, are all identity and access management services that will help you achieve that level of security and those that concept of least privilege. 
When we talk about detection, services like Amazon Inspector, CloudWatch, and CloudTrail will help you with monitoring your environment for vulnerabilities, monitoring your environment for any abnormal behavior or in all interactions and API calls that are occurring within the cloud, really to give you that observability and visibility into what's happening. Within infrastructure protection, AWS provides a lot of services that we would traditionally see within an environment, such as your firewall manager, your network firewall, uh, your web application firewall. But as I had mentioned in all the architectures, you'll notice underpinning all of those is the Amazon Virtual Private Cloud and making sure that as you look at your network access control lists and your security groups, limiting all of that um, communication to your servers and your SCADA environment to what's absolutely necessary. Again, that's helping you build that secure environment. It's also helping with visibility and observability in the environment. And then, as I'd mentioned, make sure you're leveraging AWS Private Link, uh, Direct Connect or Global Accelerator for all the communication uh, in transit. When it comes to data protection, making sure that you're encrypting all of your data at rest, leveraging keys, so either AWS Key Management Service, uh, we also provide AWS Cloud HSM or Hardware Security Management. There's also Certificate Manager, which will allow you to create um, any certificates, uh, private or public, that you, that you may require for your SCADA services. And then anywhere where you have internet connections coming into your environment, making sure that you're leveraging AWS VPN or VPN connections and having everything encrypted. And then finally, in the event that you do need to respond to an incident, using services such as Detective, Security Hub, um, Event Bridge, there's many services in this space. Security Hub is a great one to help you with the visibility into what's happening and pulling information, that observability across all of these pillars into a single place where you can take action and review what's going on. And then as I mentioned, compliance. I'm gonna walk through some of the security best practices. I've talked a lot about, about these as I've been speaking about the architectures, but when it comes to network secure, security, making sure that all of the communications are authenticated and ideally mutually authenticated using X509 certificates. These certificates can be generated and rotated automatically leveraging something such as Amazon Certificate Manager, or you can manage them and create them yourself as well. I did mention this as well in the architecture, making sure that all of the connections are initiated from your local control site into AWS, as you do not want to open your connections from the cloud directly into your control sites. Making sure that all of that communication is encrypted, leveraging TLS. I talked about as well, leveraging AWS Global Accelerator for faster data transfer to minimize that latency and to also give you the ability and resiliency to fail over IPs from region to region. Leveraging AWS Direct Connect, taking that traffic off of the public internet and using your ISP's backbone to a direct connection into AWS. And then making sure that you're using private endpoints whenever you're using global services. So if, for example, you're leveraging S3 as your object storage to store all your backups and configurations, by leveraging private endpoints, you're, you're using AWS's backbone to keep all that information within the AWS environment and not sending it back out to the public internet. Security best practices when it comes to uh, our VPCs or virtual private clouds, making sure that your make any entry into and communication coming into your VPC is being done through a network load balancer, and that within that network load balancer, you're restricting all of that access and, uh, to IP specific IP addresses, and that you're placing the appropriate security group controls around all of the components, such as the network load balancer, the servers that are running your SCADA environment, the databases, and any of the applications that you're running on on top of that. And then also making sure that you're including your network access control lists uh, to control all of that traffic to the VPC as well. When it comes to security and monitoring, using tools like and services like GuardDuty and CloudTrail allow you to monitor the network traffic and, and gives you that visibility and transparency into what's occurring. And with CloudTrail, monitoring all the API calls that are occurring Again, making sure that you're, you're keeping that transparency uh, and observability into what's going on. This will help both with security troubleshooting, but as well troubleshooting any of the um, issues that may occur within the application. So you can see all the API calls that were made. And then finally, the best practice here as well, as I mentioned, is encrypting all of your data at rest using keys, 
uh, or certificates. Those can be stored in key management service and generated from key management service, as well as in transit. So using public certificate uh, certificates uh, and encrypting everything uh, using TLS. One of the points that I discussed early on in this discussion was the idea that you could build highly resilient and secure services and SCADA solutions on top of AWS services. Again, by leveraging the global scale of AWS's environment, you're able to build these highly resilient services. And some of the best practices I want to talk to you about are making sure that you deploy these services into multiple availability zones. Again, this is giving you the ability to mitigate the risk of an availability zone being unavailable or a service within that zone being unavailable. By deploying these servers into private subnets, you can also restrict all internet access to and from these servers, making sure that you're reducing that threat uh, footprint to those servers. As you deploy these servers at scale into multiple regions, again, increasing that resiliency by following the security best practice, you're really giving yourself the ability to scale across regions and mitigate the risk of having a regional failure or a service within that region failing and flipping over to an additional region with multiple availability zones. All of the data and server configuration, SCADA configuration, should be backed up to an object store such as Amazon S3. Having that S3 bucket uh, and all of that backup being stored in a different region within a different account will again help with that resiliency of if you are, find yourself in the uh, situation where you need to recover that data, you have access to it and are able to restore it uh, from that other region into an environment that will get you back up and running in the shortest period of time possible. And again, by leveraging infrastructure as code and building all of your infrastructure, you're able to deploy consistently an environment that will get you back up and running in the shortest period of time. And leveraging a service such as AWS CloudFormation and CloudFormation templates will really help you build these consistent environments and again, reduce the amount of uh, manual intervention you have as you build these servers uh, and reducing the risk of building uh, or, or producing problems, introducing problems. The final best practice I want to talk to you today about is identity and access. And again, as I mentioned, identity and access management, making sure that the author, the right users are taking the right actions that they're allowed to do is all part of this idea of identity and access management and building in least privilege into all of your services. Because in AWS, everything is an API call, you're able to leverage services such as AWS's identity and access management to do fine-tuned access control and really limit and make sure that all of the service to service, server to server, and user to server, or user to service interactions are authorized and authenticated. So you're making sure again that you have the appropriate user taking the appropriate and allowed actions. By reducing things such as SSH connections into your servers, again, leveraging session manager in this case to have to gain access to your servers is going to help with reducing that security risk. And again, by can't stress this enough, but by building everything as code and using infrastructure as code, you really reduce the uh, the requirement for people and, and staff to actually log directly into servers when they're making changes. So you can actually make changes as code and then do consistent deployments across your environments. Just wrapping up everything again, I wanna thank you for joining me today. And I wish you the best of luck as you build secure and resilient solutions on top of AWS services. Thank you.